and welcome back. Um, you probably notice I have been in the same clothes and in the same location as one of my previous films, videos, episodes, whatever you want to call them. Um, that's because I actually did multiple videos at the same time, just because I don't have a whole lot of time to do videos, so I generally stop. Um, this is going to continue on my quest for a decent to good point and shoot that's either zoom, a, uh, either has zoom or it is a prime lens. Prime lens generally is better when it comes to point and shoots for clarity. Zoom lenses generally are not as desirable, so they generally can be a little bit soft. The, the lens isn't as crisp or nice. So, my goal is to find a point and shoot that one isn't ridiculously expensive. You know, I'm, I'm gonna say under $70. Let's just say under $70. I'll set that right there. Cause you can do $100, $125, $200 on point and shoots on some of those Olympus styluses that take fantastic photos. But I wanna cut that back. I wanna cut that back and find something that is going to be inexpensive inexpensive, disposable for the most part. If it breaks, if it drops, if you lose it, if it gets wet and gets ruined, it, it's not a big deal. So you saw my first video, which I had the uh, Minolta um, Explorer Freedom or Freedom Explorer Plus or Zoom or EX, whatever the heck the name that thing was. That's generally what I carry around in my uh, in my vehicle with me, and it takes decent photos. So right now, that is probably my favorite point and shoot that I have. Now, I bought a lot, and I don't mean like a lot or a lot. Anyway, I bought a box uh, with about 15 pounds of point and shoots and miscellaneous cameras. So I have a bunch of these point and shoots sitting at home in my office and I'm gonna start just taking them out and start shooting with them. I have some Pentaxes, I have some uh, uh, Minoltas, some Olympuses, uh, I have a couple Canons. So we're gonna see. We're gonna see how they turn out and how they look and, and if it works, great, great. If it doesn't, yeah, whatever. I didn't pay a whole lot for them, so I don't really care. Um, so today we're gonna to start with the Canon SureShot 60 Zoom. That's this guy right here. And at first appearance, it's nice, it's sleek, it's relatively small in size. I would say it's probably a little bit smaller lengthwise for my Minolta. Uh, thickness of it's about the same, so not a huge deal. Um, it's plastic, of course. They're they're all pretty much going to be plastic. Not much you can do about it. Uh, on the top here, it has a little LED display or LCD display that, for whatever stupid reason, um, these camera companies thought it would be smart to keep telling you how many exposures you have left, even when it's turned off, which is just absolutely ridiculously stupid. So, because these take CR one two threes. Um, or the CR123A battery. And while they're not super expensive, you just can't run to most local stores and just buy it like if it was running two double A's or something like that. Anyway, um, this has a 38 to 60 zoom and it is at 4.5 to 6.7 uh, for the aperture. Now, when you look at it, Looks clean, looks nice, nice and flush. The, the lens kind of folds away, but it has a really, really big uh, viewfinder on the back compared to a lot of other um, point shoots. And I like that. I like a big um, viewfinder. It looks really good, actually. It's a really nice viewfinder that they have in this. Uh, and it does zoom with the, with the lens as you zoom in. And it has some little, um, some little framing lines in there to kind of tell you where your frame is. And it has like the, the little center square just showing you what the center of the frame is gonna be. And the autofocus on this seems to work pretty good. I haven't shot anything in it, haven't put any film in it yet, so I have no idea. On the back side, you have a dial, which tells you your different shooting settings. So you can go into off, of course, auto, with, which is green with a little eye, so that means it has red eye reduction with the flash on. Then it has just auto with no uh, um, red eye reduction. 
Then you have, you set it to have flash every single time, no matter what. Then you have flat, no flash, and then you have timer. So today I'm just going to put it on as probably no flash. I, I really don't need the flash. And as you can see, this tends to extract out. On the top, it actually gives you what your, mil what your uh, focal length is set at. So from 38 to 60. So you can just quickly look at it and tell, oh, I'm at 60, or I'm at 52, I'm at 45. Now, it stops at each one of those focal points. So you're either at 38, or you, you zoom in once, it goes to 45, 52, or 60. So I'm gonna throw, like always, when I test out a new camera, I always throw some uh, Ilford HP5 in there. And the reason for that is because one, it's inexpensive. I go with the 24 exposure. And I can just develop it at home. I don't have to send it off to the lab. So I can just do it like almost immediately to make sure that there's no light leaks, that everything's working properly, and all that fun stuff. So I'm gonna throw this in there. And this is a 400 ISO. And of course, it's really sunny out, which you're not really supposed to uh, load film in direct sunlight but not much of a choice. Now, to open up your film door, there's a little switch on the side right here that you hit, and it just pops it right open. Now, this reads DX codes, so there's no, there's no ISO setting for it whatsoever. It just automatically reads that code and does its thing. So pretty much you just throw the film into the, into the back, close it, turn it on, and it's already automatically gonna wind and bring you to exposure number one. And there we are, right? exposure number one. Now, on, nice thing is on the back on a lot of these point and shoots is that it has a little window there to tell you what you have in there. So you can see it's a 24 exposure, HP5 plus. And it's kind of smart because they put it in a way where your finger covers a hole normally when you're shooting, just to reduce any risk of um, any kind of light, uh, light leaks or light containment. So, to start, I am going to take a shot of my camera here, that's recording us, at 38 millimeter. Let me put this over to no flash, and let's see how this works. I get a nice little green light in my eyepiece. And it took a photo and it's super quiet. Um, not sure how well you can actually hear this, um, but wow, it's really, really quiet of a camera. Now, on the back side, there is this little green light. I doubt you can see it in this bright light, but yeah. So it turns on when you half press your shutter release, telling you that green, good to go. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna turn the flash on and see if it does actually change the aperture a little bit. There we go. Let's go back and now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. I'm fully zoomed and I'm gonna shoot That's quiet. Um, and then I'm gonna do it again with the flash on. There we go. All right. So now I'm gonna go and take some shots. Okay, so right here, uh, I, I didn't have my lav on, so there was just way too much wind noise. It's very windy out. So all I'm really doing here is just trying out the, the camera. I was shooting it and seeing how it blurs out the background. It's really all that I'm doing here. I'm doing one shot at 38 millimeter and another shot at 60. Now I moved on from there and I ended up going out to the same areas that I was at before with the Minolta and decided to take a couple shots that were similar to what I took with the Minolta a few months ago. And here are those photos. 
Now, all of these photos were done on different days, of course. And you can tell in the street sign one here, there's no leaves there. And then in the next frame, there's leaves. So they're quite separated. And also, the Minolta was shot in a bright sunlight. And the only day that I had a chance to get out with the Canon, it was actually overcast. So that's going to make the photos look a little different. But quality-wise, I would say that they're very, very similar. I, I really can't tell much apart between the two of them as far as quality goes w with the lens and how they react. Maybe the Canon does a little bit better with exposure, but even still, I can't tell because the two days were so different. One was overcast, one was sunny. So I'm going to call it a wash between these two. I'm going to say both of these are probably roughly about the same quality. Um, however, I think you can find the Canon for much cheaper on eBay. So now while the Canon is about half the price of the Minolta, the Minolta is a little better quality constructed. It feels a little heavier, a little bit stronger. It just feels a little bit more quality in a sense. However, it does have a smaller viewfinder and it does have that fake panoramic mode on the Minolta where the Canon has that big, beautiful, bright viewfinder, which in my opinion, I would rather go with the Canon over the Minolta because that panorama mode is dumb and that viewfinder on the Canon is awesome. So I'll leave you with a couple more of these photos from earlier today and I will see you in the next video. Thank you to all my subscribers. We doubled it from the last video. So thank you and I'll see you in the next one.